<laughs> anyway, so again, welcome everybody to our Skeptics in the Diner event. This is uh, the event that we started with New York City Skeptics back in 2007. Obviously, we always uh, meet at the uh, on the second Saturday at the diner where I am at now, as you can see there. Um, again, hopefully soon we'll be able to meet in person and we will probably end up doing uh, both an in-person and uh, and we'll, we'll probably keep doing the virtual ones and in person. It would be nice to also uh, do keep doing both. Uh, we have a couple of other events, New York City Skeptics. Uh, we have our Drinking Skeptically event at the on the third Monday of every month. This month is going to be on the 19th at our virtual bar. And we have the Nexus, which is the Northeast Conference in Science and Skepticism, which is a co-production with the Skeptics Guide to the Universe. And this year, again, it will be, uh, and it will be, it will happen virtually on, uh, what is it, August 6th and 7th. We will distribute the information. And we have our yearly Skeptic Camp in December. It's an all day event where people, normal people, uh, the audience gets a chance to uh, presentations. And uh, stay tuned for any other events that we may have. I'll be posting on our meetup. Our speaker today is a frequent guest, of course, and most of you know him, if not everybody, is our, uh, and a prominent member of our local skeptic community. He has a PhD in evolutionary biology from the University of Connecticut and a PhD in philosophy from the University of Tennessee. I think there's another one there, but somehow it's not on this bio. He may correct that later. Uh, he currently is the KD Irani Professor of Philosophy at the City College of New York. His research interests include the philosophy of science, the relationship between science and philosophy, the nature of pseudoscience, and the practical philosophy of stoicism. Uh, with that, uh, we'll do this, and then we'll have a Q&A, and that's when we'll start a muting, raise your hand, and that's what we're going to do. So, Massimo, take it over. Thanks, Benny. It's a pleasure to be here as usual. Let me share my screen so that we can have a little bit of a conversation here, well, a little bit of a starter for our conversation later. So we're going to talk about bullshit. And uh, as I'll explain in a minute, this has actually become a technical term in philosophy, believe it or not. Uh, and it's actually very useful. As it turns out, what I'll try to uh, you know, get across today is that the technical conception of bullshit is a unifying concept that may explain what uh, things like pseudoscience and pseudo-philosophy have in common and what things like science and philosophy, on the other hand, uh, lack or don't, don't have. So that's the basic idea. We're going to talk about what philosophers call the demarcation problem. How do you separate different ways of doing things, science from pseudoscience, philosophy from pseudo-philosophy, and so on and so forth. Now, the demarcation problem is an old problem in, in uh, philosophy of science. Officially, it was introduced by uh, Karl Popper in the modern literature in the, at the beginning of the 20th century. Popper was one of the most influential philosophers of uh, the 20th century. But in reality, it goes all the way back to uh, 5th century BCE Athens. There is a dia platonic dialogue called the Carmides in which Socrates asks the question, how do we tell the difference between a doctor and a quack? So, he, you know, Socrates himself was interested in uh, what we today call the demarcation problem. So uh, the, the quote that you're seeing here is from, from Popper. And uh, uh, one of the reasons he got interested in the demarcation uh, issue is because he was suspicious of certain epistemic activities, as philosophers call them. That is, certain ways of knowing things. And in particular, psychoanalysis of the Freudian and Adlerian uh, persuasion. And there is this quote that I really like uh, that really explains what Popper thought about psychoanalysis. He says, once in 1919, I reported to Adler a case which to me did not seem particularly Adlerian, but which he found no difficulty in analyzing in terms of his theory of inferiority feelings, although he had not even seen the child. Slightly shocked, I asked him how he could be so sure. Because of my thousandfold experience, he replied. 
Whereupon I could not help saying, and with this new case, I suppose your experience has become thousand and one fold. In other words, Popper thought that this was in fact the kind of bullshit that, that Adler and other psychoanalysts were just making things up as they went. And there was essentially no way to uh, show that they, were, that they were wrong on something, which led Popper to propose his famous uh, criterion for demarcating science from pseudoscience known today as uh, falsification or falsifiability. So Popper thought very unusually, actually, among philosophers, that science is a deductive uh, kind of enterprise, not inductive. Now, the difference between deduction and induction is that in the case of induction, uh, one makes generalizations out of a series of known cases. So you study a population of phenomena, and then you generalize to broader and broader phenomena. And most scientists actually would argue, and most philosophers of science today would argue that that, at least in part, how science works by induction. But Popper thought that no, the real, the, the actual way, the underlying structure of science really is deductive, as in uh, it can be described by formal logic. In particular, if something is a deductive activity, then one can apply a speci specific type of uh, logical reasoning called modus tollens. Modus tollens in logic works like this if p then q not q therefore not p now why the hell am i telling you that because popper applied exactly this structure as i'll show you in the next slide to the notion of how science works or doesn't work he says by modus tollens if theory x is correct then we should make observation q q is not observed therefore x is false so he was saying that the way to that actually science makes progress here is by falsifying, by rejecting theories that turn out to be incorrect. How do we know that a theory turned out to be incorrect? Because if the theory makes a prediction and the prediction doesn't come true, then we it is logical, as in modus tollens logical, uh, to infer, uh, to deduce that the theory is in fact incorrect. Now notice that even if this is true, and I'll, I'll argue in a minute that it's not, it doesn't work like, quite like that in, in, in real science. But even if this is true, uh, all we have, therefore, that uh, scientific, scientific theories are either wrong or we have to sus suspend our judgment. Because if, in fact, Q is observed, if the observation that is predicted by the theory X is uh, verified, that doesn't mean uh, that theory X is true logic does not license us to say that we only can say that uh, the theory survived yet another test and that's about it so according to popper science makes progress basically by eliminating one bad theory at a time and the theories that survive every round are not true or we shouldn't think of them as true we should only think of them as those that have survived so far but they might actually uh, encounter their demise in the next uh, the next round the classic example that Popper uh, brought up was the, the first, one of the first spectacular confirmations of the general theory of relativity. Uh, during 1919, there was a, an eclipse, a total eclipse of the sun, and Einstein had made a very specific prediction, which is summarized by this cartoon. If the theory is correct, then the sun, being uh, uh, you know, the source of a large gravitational field, should in fact bend the light coming from the stars behind. And so therefore you should observe a shift in the position, an apparent shift in the position of the stars as is explained in the, in the figure. Uh, you can see these only during a total eclipse because of course during the day, uh, normally the sun will completely obscure uh, you know, the, the visibility of any, of any stars. Well, a lot of astronomers went all over around the world took pictures of the very precise measurements and pictures of what was going on during the eclipse. And it turns out that in fact, that the theory was spectacularly confirmed. Einstein became a celebrity overnight. There were you know, like large titles in the newspapers all over the world the following day. But technically, uh, Popper would say, it's not that we can therefore say that general relativity is true. We can say that it hasn't been falsified yet. Right? But this was, however, an impressive test because, as Popper put it, the, the theory really stuck its neck out uh, and, and you know, took a really big risk, and it survived. And the more theories take big risks and survive, the more we can be confident that you know, maybe we're on the, right, on the right track. Well, this is all very and good, but it doesn't work with, in, in reality. Why not? Because of a problem called the Duhem-Quine problem, which is named after uh, Pierre Duhem, who's a physicist on the left, and uh, W.V.O. Quine, who was a philosopher on the, on the right. Duhem and Quine independently pointed out that the problem is with falsification is, is this. 
you actually never test just the crucial hypothesis that you think you're testing. You're also testing a lot of other ancillary hypotheses, including, for instance, uh, the reliability of the instrumentation, uh, the reliability of your calculations, uh, the uh, truth of additional scientific theories that are uh, ancillary or, or um, more basic than the one that you're uh, that you're considering now for instance in the case of the test of the general theory of relativity not only this was actually a test of the reliability of the telescopes and the reliability of the uh, photography the reliability of the measurements of the calculations etc but even of the laws of optics so joem and quine pointed out that if in fact a theory fails a test you cannot really eliminate it immediately because it could be that the theory is correct and one of the ancillary hypotheses or the instrumentation uh, are, are the sources of the error, right? So the only way to, to figure this out is to repeat testing over and over under a variety of circumstances and then see whether unbalanced scientists are satisfied uh, with the performance of the theory or not. But that is not falsification. Uh, it doesn't work the way, therefore, uh, Popper uh, thought it, it would. Now, it turns out that, you know, I'm, I'm not going to give you the whole history of falsification attempts from uh, Popper until today because it's a long and complicated one. And uh, I'll give you some references maybe at the end of this talk if you're interested in that topic. All right, let me just jump to the early 20th, 21st century where I think the, the uh, consensus among uh, philosophy of science is that there is no, no, no sharp demarcation. There's no straightforward demarcation between science and pseudoscience. Rather, uh, the issue looks like the slide that I'm showing you now. It's kind of a complex territory. The two axes represent a degree of theoretical understanding or sophistication on the horizontal axis versus a degree of empirical knowledge or content on the uh, vertical axis. And you can see that there are some disciplines or some theories that are clearly scientific. Nobody really doubts it. For instance, on the upper right side, particle physics, evolutionary biology, molecular biology, et cetera, et cetera. There are also, con uh, contrary-wise, a number of approaches or theories or notions that are clearly pseudoscientific uh, that pretty much anybody in philosophy of science or science agrees that they are. Look at the lower left corner, for instance, astrology, uh, HIV denialism, intelligent design creationism, that sort of stuff. But then there is a lot of stuff in between, somewhere in this large territory, between this really solid good sciences on the one hand and the really solid pseudosciences on the other hand, where it gets complicated and, of course, it gets interesting. Right. For instance, psychology, economics, sociology, the so-called soft sciences actually have a variable degree of theoretical sophistication, higher in economics, for instance, lower in sociology. Uh, they also have a certain degree of empirical uh, content, lower in economics, higher in psychology. But that combination doesn't put them straight into the hard sciences such as you know, uh, physics, biology, etc. But it doesn't certainly put them into the pseudosciences either. And then there are other uh, other examples that are shown in this uh, on this diagram. So it's a complicated uh, landscape, and you know this is fine. I could end the talk right here and say, okay, we're done. But in fact, there are some new developments that I wanted to talk to you about that I think are interesting and are putting a little uh, an interesting additional twist on this story. Before we get there, however, let me uh, point out that it is not too difficult to conceptualize the difference between science and pseudoscience, right? We, that's what, as skeptics, that's what we talk about a lot of the times, the astrology, ufology, uh, you know, ESP, et cetera, et cetera. But what about these other uh, contrasts that I mentioned a couple of times already? That is the contrast between what we might call philosophy and pseudo-philosophy, pseudo-philosophy as an analogy with pseudoscience. Well, that one is a little bit more complicated, but it's there nevertheless. Uh, in, within philosophy, there are discussions going on that are similar to the discussions that we have within science about what really is a good approach to things and what it's re really not, not that good. For instance, there are currently two major approaches to the study of metaphysics. So metaphysics is that, that area of philosophy that deals with the foundations of reality. One approach to metaphysics, sometimes referred to as scientific metaphysics, that's, there's a book by that title that I'm showing you on the, on the left, um, is uh, essentially, I'll, I'll, I'll show you in a minute a little bit more detail about it, but essentially says that you know, the, the goal of metaphysics is to figure out how the sciences hang together and how they talk to each other, and then to come up with this more general view of the world that is, however, scientifically grounded. If it's not scientifically grounded, then it's not a good thing. And then there is another way of doing metaphysics, 
uh, sometimes referred to as analytical metaphysics, which is represented by that book on the right called Meta Metaphysics. Uh, that, on the other hand, says that, no, we can discover things by, uh, you know, just thinking about it uh, really hard, just like Plato was doing, uh, you know, 24, 24 centuries ago. And um, I'll give you a hint about if you want to decide which one is, is, in my opinion, philosophy, which one is pseudo-philosophy. Uh, the hint here is always be suspicious of the word meta. If you have, in this case, if you have a meta-meta, I think that's trouble. So which one is which? Which one is what? Well, here's two quotes uh, from authors in two, uh, these two different uh, areas of metaphysics. The first one says, scientific philosophy is a version, or scientific metaphysics is a version of naturalism. It consists of an extreme skepticism about metaphysics when it is based on conceptual analysis tested against intuition and about any alleged a priori truths that such intuitions and analysis might yield. And two, the belief that scientific results and scientific methods can be successfully applied to some problems that could be called metaphysical. Here's the second quote. Because the idea of zombies seems to make sense and seems to, in a certain sense, be possible, I think one can use that to argue against the thesis that everything is purely physical. Now, I don't know how long is going to, uh, you know, your intuition, what your intuitions are about these two, these two cases, but it seems to me that the first quote, which comes from the first book, uh, Scientific Metaphysics, is perfectly reasonable and in, in, in alignment with what philosophers should be doing. The second one, which comes from one of the authors of the second book on meta-metaphysics, is highly, highly questionable. Why, whether is it really pseudo-philosophy or not remains open, I suppose, but it's highly questionable. So the whole point was to, to show that this kind of debate that we're having between uh, science and pseudoscience is also true in philosophy versus pseudo-philosophy, and just in the same way in which there's no sharp demarcation between science and pseudoscience, there also is no sharp demarcation between philosophy and pseudo-philosophy. And now we get to the uh, major concept that I wanted to talk to you about today. That's the concept of bullshit. I highly recommend this work called On Bullshit by Henry Frank Frankfurt. Is, uh, Frankfurt is a philosopher and uh, he wrote this little booklet. It's, it's, very, it's actually an essay that then Univers um, Princeton University Press turned into a book. And uh, it's, it's a small book, as I said, you can read it in an afternoon. And it was an incredible success. Success. This came out a few years ago and it's become a bestseller uh, in, uh, uh, in philosophical circles and outside philosophical circles. Circles. It's very approachable. It can be read by people without a uh, technical background in philosophy. Now, uh, Frankfurt uh, mentions the, the notion that uh, in the book that one of the most salient features of our culture is that there is so much bullshit. I'm sure we can all agree with that. But what does he mean by bullshit? Here's an extended quote from uh, Frankfurt. It is impossible for someone to lie unless he thinks he knows the truth. A person who lies is thereby responding to the truth, and he is to that extent respectful of it. When an honest man speaks, he says only what he believes to be true. And for the liar, it is correspondingly indispensable that he consider his statements to be false. For the bullshitter, however, all these bets are off. He is neither on the side of the true nor on the side of the false. His eye is not on the facts at all, as the eyes of the honest man and of the liar are. He does not care whether the things he says describe reality correctly. So here, uh, Bull, uh, <laughs> Frankfurt is, is, is uh, making a distinction between three kind of what we, what we might say, we might call epistemic agents. The person who lies, the liar, the liar, in order to be effective at lying, actually has to know where the truth uh, is, because otherwise he's not going to be an effective liar. So in a sense, he has a respect for the truth, not because he really wants to push the truth, but because he needs to stay away from it. The honest person, of course, has presumably a respect for the truth and tries to speak the truth uh, more, more often than not, you know, or as, as much as is possible. The bullshitter, on the other hand, the third kind of epistemic agent, just doesn't care. The bullshitter has a different agenda. He wants to be right at all uh, in, in, in everything, or he wants to push an ideological agenda, or he wants to push whatever it is that he wants to push. And he does it by mixing things that are true, half true, false, and so on and so forth, because he doesn't care about the uh, epistemic uh, accuracy of what he's saying. He cares about his, his ultimate objective. Okay, So in that sense, bullshit is different from lying. <laughs> 
Now, there are two important characteristics of bullshitting from a philosophical perspective. First of all, bullshit is a normative concept. That is, it's not just descriptive of how things are. It is uh, normative about things, how things ought to be, how epistemic agents ought to behave. So it means that it is about how one ought to behave, as I just said, or not to behave. And then two, the specific type of culpability that can be attributed to the bullshitter is epistemic culpability. So the bullshitter is committing a, uh, you know, a, a, a faux pas, it's committing a mistake there. The mistake here, or it's, it's culpable about something, and that culpability is epistemic. He's not accurate about his epistemic warrant. When he says things, he doesn't really care whether these things are true or not. Now, another author about, about whom I will say more in a few minutes, Victor Moberger, says the bullshitter is assumed to be capable of responding to reasons and arguments, but fails to do so. Why? Because he doesn't care enough. Right? So that's the difference between the bullshitter and either the liar again or the honest uh, epistemic agent. Now, the concept of bullshitting, in my mind, is very closely related to something that I uh, care a lot about because I think it's an interesting way of thinking about epistemology or, you know, theory of truth, and that is virtue epistemology. Uh, virtue epistemology is this notion that we are, we ought to behave virtuously when it comes to truth. In other words, we should seek truth. We should, uh, you know, make sure that we have the best tools in order to find the truth. We should, uh, uh, you know, not, uh, you know, abstain from from saying something if we're not sure about it, if we don't have sufficient warrants uh, for it, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So that's virtue epistemology. We can all arrive at the wrong conclusion of course, on any specific subject matter, right? Or, or unwittingly defend incorrect notions. None of us is a, the, a, the, the virtue epistemology equivalent of a sage, of the perfect epistemic agent. We all make mistakes. But so long as we make those mistakes in good faith, that just means we're human beings and we're not bullshitters. The bullshitter, however, is pathologically epistemically culpable, right? That person incurs in epistemic vices, which is obviously the opposite of virtue, and he doesn't care about it so long as he gets whatever he wants out of the deal. And that whatever he wants could be, you know, being right in a discussion uh, at all costs or further his favorite uh, uh, a priori ideological position, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, so that's the difference between a virtuous agent. A virtuous agent doesn't mean, virtuous epistemic agent doesn't mean you're always right. Nobody's always right. It just means you're striving to be right. To, you're doing, you're conscientious about it. The bullshit, on the, other, on the other hand, is not just epistemically culpable, he's pathologically epistemically culpable. That's his characteristic. So I like then, then to introduce this paper that came out recently, uh, last year, by the already mentioned Victor Moberger. And I think it's one of the best year, uh, papers in the philosophy of science of the demarcation problem that has come out in a, in a, in a long time. It's published in a work in a, in a journal called Theoria. You can actually look it online and download it for free if you like. It's called Bullshit, Pseudoscience, and Pseudophilosophy. And so I want to get a little bit more in details about how Moberger applies the concept of bullshit that comes from uh, Frankfurt to the general problem of the demarcation problems between science and pseudoscience on the one hand and uh, uh, science, uh, philosophy and pseudophilosophy on the other hand. So we're all familiar with examples of pseudoscientific bullshitting. We've talked about it already. Astrology, creationism, homeopathy, homeopathy ufology, you name it. But what kind of ki kinds of pseudo philosophy are there? I, I already hinted at one you know, within the, the area of metaphysics. Are there others? Well, yes, there are two. According, there are two categories, in fact, of pseudo philosophy according to Moberger. One is what he calls obscurantist pseudo philosophy, and he defines it as a seemingly profound type of academic discourse that is pursued primarily within the humanities and social sciences. So sometimes, and you know, I work in a philosophy department, and sometimes I do come across uh, what he calls obscurantist pseudo philosophy. That is, philosophers, these are professionals who uh, talk in a way that is that seems perversely uh, ob obfuscatory, that that you know, using terms that they have to they, they never define or they define in, in by using even more obfuscatory language, um, or in general, just presenting notions that don't have a hell of a lot of epistemic warrant. That's a obscurantist pseudo-philosophy. And then there is scientific pseudo-philosophy, 
which uh, Moberger defines as, you know, usually found in popular scientific contexts where writers typically with a background in natural sciences tend to wander into philosophical territory without realizing it. And again, without awareness of relevant distinctions and arguments. Now, as it turns out, skeptics, major, some major names in, in the skeptics community are the major offenders among, uh, in, in terms of scientific pseudophilosophy. Uh, I could name a lot of names, but I'm just going to give you a few. Richard Dawkins, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, um, um, Krauss, uh, um, who else? Michael Shermer, uh, Sam Harris. All of these people have committed sci scientific pseudophilosophy. Uh, in fact, Moberger mentions a couple of these specific examples and why they count as pseudophilosophy. So the bottom line is that pseudoscience is bullshit with scientific pretensions while pseudo-philosophy is bullshit with philosophical pretensions. Where again, bullshit, so what they have in common, pseudoscience and pseudo-philosophy uh, is bullshit. And where again, bullshit here is not just a general derogatory uh, term that you apply to whatever you don't like, is, is, is a pathological deficiency, epistemic deficiency, right? Now, bullshitting manifests itself differently, however, in pseudoscience and in pseudo-philosophy. And let's see how. In the case of pseudoscience, we, we, we tend to see a play things like classical logical fallacies and other kind of reasoning errors, right? So you're all familiar with this notion that, you know, you can often point out where a creationist or a you know, ufologist or an astrologist or whatever it is, is uh, committing a logical fallacy, typically an informal logical fallacy, right? And then we can all play that game and say, oh, that's an adominum, that is a genetic fallacy, that is this and that and the other. And sometimes, you know, often we get it right. Sometimes I think skeptics overuse the uh, fallacies terminologies. But nevertheless, in the case of pseudoscience, that's what happens. It's usually a matter of log classical logical fallacies or, or reasoning errors. In the case of pseudophilosophy, however, we see, according to Moberger, Equivocation due to conceptual impressionism, whereby plausible but trivial propositions lend apparent credibility to interesting but implausible ones. I love the, the phrase, uh, you know, um, conceptual impressionism. So let me give you an example. Back in the 90s, there was a, a, such a thing as the science wars, where a number of sociologists and, philosopher, uh, and philosophers, not philosophers of science usually, uh, were in, enamored with a kind of a post, extreme postmodern post -modern approach, uh, where they would say things like, you know, science is a social construction. Well, let me show you how that phrase, science is a social construction, uh, can be either plausible but trivial or, or interesting but implausible. So if, if when you say that science is a social construction, you're saying that science is a human activity done by human beings and overseen by human institutions, that is absolutely true. There's nothing controversial about that. But it is trivially true. It's nothing particularly interesting uh, follows from it. If, on the other hand, you mean that science, as in including uh, scientific theory, scientific experiments, and all that sort of stuff, if you think that that is entirely human construction, has no connection with the rest of the world, then now you're saying something interesting with the way the world is. You're saying now something interesting, but it's also highly implausible, right? So this conceptual impressionism uh, allows people to equivocate between things that are true but trivial and things that sound interesting but are clearly false. Now, there are a number of consequences uh, of Moberger's analysis as far as we are concerned in, in terms of the demarcation problem, and so let me point out uh, a few. First of all, it is a mistake to focus on specific claims that are made by proponents of pseudosciences. Uh, and, and that is one mistake that really skeptics do a lot. We, we spend an inordinate amount of time trying to show how the, you know, the, the latest thing that the astrologer or the home homeopath and so on and so forth said was wrong. Yes, we know it's wrong. We, we, there is a lot of evidence at this point that homeopathy doesn't work. So doing one more experiment or one more demonstration that homeopathy doesn't work, it's not really useful. That shouldn't be the focus, according to Moberger. That is because... In fact, sometimes even pseudoscientific practitioners do get things right. And of course, scientists could get things wrong. So it isn't really about the specific claims. Specific claims need to be analyzed if there is doubt whether they're correct or not, right? But in general, the focus that the skeptics put on the claims themselves is uh, misleading. We should focus instead on the epistemic malpractice. We should show that astrologers, ufologists, and so on and so forth are simply not doing what it what is required to 
uh, present a good case for what they want to push, for the notions that they want to push. Okay, so it's about the malpractice, the epistemic malpractice, not about the content specific uh, specifically. Two. The thing that is bad about pseudoscience and pseudo philosophy is not that they are not scientific. We, you know, skeptics often throw out this term, oh, that's unscientific, as if that's were an insult. But there's plenty of things that are non-scientific, and that's not an insult at all. Literature, for instance. Literature is unscientific, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't have value, right? So, so let's stop throwing out the word unscientific as if it were an insult. Uh, it's only unscientific in a particular domain and in particular uh, you know, area of application. And therefore, again, we go to the malpractice notion here, not to the fact that something is unscientific. It doesn't matter whether something is scientific or non-scientific. It, it, what what uh, matters is if it has value and if it, is, if it has epistemic warrant. Third, pseudoscience doesn't lack empirical content. It's not true that, that pseudoscientists don't have empirical data. They do. For instance, astrology is plenty of empirical data. They just don't stand up to critical scrutiny, right? So again, it's about the practice. It's not about the specific content. Now, before we go out and, and start shouting bullshit to everyone that we disagree with, however, um, we can begin by, and we should begin, by cleaning up our own house. What I mean by that? Well, too often skeptics or so-called skeptics reject unusual or unorthodox claims a priori, without even you know looking into it, without critical analysis or investigation, just like Adler was doing uh, in the case of uh, you know psychoanalysis uh, that uh, Popper was uh, was bringing up at the beginning of this of this talk, there are documented cases of this. Uh, there is a famous case, for instance, the Campeche UFOs from several years ago in, in Mexico, where there were these, these lights that were observed by a military aircraft in the middle of the night, and they were moving, apparently moving around a little bit, etc. And several local skeptics were asked their opinion, and they came up with all sorts of stuff, like, oh, no, it was uh, actually... Uh, uh, reflections on the atmosphere, or there was a meteorite, or was this or that or that. Turns out they were just making up shit as they go. They had no idea what was going on. They had no idea what the phenomena actually was, and they didn't bother. So they were, in fact, bullshitting. Skeptics themselves can bullshit, and it's not a good thing, right? Turns out that the flares in question were actually uh, distance images of um, uh, you know, oil fields which were particularly bright in the infrared and they were kind of moving because of uh, air movements. But it took some serious investigation done actually by the people at Skeptical Inquirer, as it turns out, uh, to figure out what was going on. You can't just say no uh, reflexively. That is not good epistemic practice. That puts you on par with the bullshitter. And believe me, you don't want to be in that category. The same goes in the case of alleged pseudo-philosophical notions. Uh, for instance, uh, when people like uh, some of the people that I mentioned earlier uh, engage in simplistic criticism of postmodern authors. Uh, postmodernism has, be has become a bad word in, in both science, for, according to certain scientists and according even to certain skeptics, even though I would wager that most of these people, if not all of them, have never actually read anything by a postmodern author. Turns out, postmodern analysis uh, in certain in certain areas actually has been, uh, you know, a good thing to do because it has brought some interesting results. I would, uh, for instance, cite uh, mention uh, Michel Foucault's analysis of the concept of madness. It's those are actually good. That's good. Good stuff that should be uh, read by people who are interested in in those in those topics. It's not. Uh, pseudo philosophy. Some, uh, you know, postmodern authors have in, indeed in, engaged in pseudo philosophy, and those are the ones that we should call on. But again, I don't know if you remember from a few years ago, a couple of uh, so-called skeptics um, uh, engaged in the, these uh, the, the penis hoax uh, thing that we actually discussed, uh, Benny, at um, one of the Nexus uh, Nexus uh, panel discussions. And I thought that was an awful example of, uh, of bullshitting by skeptics. These people were absolutely convinced that certain uh, type of uh, scholars in the humanities were just, you know, writing a bunch of nonsense. So they came up with these hoax uh, to trick some journals into publishing a fake paper. The paper was published, but only as it turns out by journals that were, you know, pay per publish of you know third or fourth rank journals it was actually rejected by a number of uh, first year journals in, in in philosophy and i think those two people should just be ashamed of themselves because they have committed again epistemic uh you know uh, 
failure of engaging the epistolary fa failure for not doing their homework. They, they didn't read any of that literature that they were criticizing. They were so sure was, uh, was so bad. So as skeptics is fine if we keep in mind that a lot of people who engage in pseudoscience or pseudo philosophy are in fact bullshitters, but let's ourselves not turn into bullshitters. So it, it all it again comes down to our character as epistemic agents, and we need to strive to act virtuously, not viciously. And let me conclude just, uh, if you don't mind, with a shameless plug for a couple of books that I wrote or edited uh, that are pertinent to this uh, topic. The one on the right is Nonsense and Stills, How to Tell Science from Bunk. Uh, that's accessible to the general public, and it's about the, the complexities of the demarcation problem between science and pseudoscience. The one on the left, The Philosophy of Pseudoscience, uh, I co-edited with my friend Martin Badri, and it's a little bit more technical, although most of the chapters are actually accessible, and it gives you a little bit more of an in-depth uh, approach to the question of demarcation. And uh, with that, uh, that's it. Uh, Benny, back to you. Good, so let's have our Q&A. If anybody wants to ask a question, please raise your You'll know where the uh, raise hand is. It's on your reactions uh, button on the bottom. There's a raise hand. And uh, okay, there you go, Rob. Let me say, let me, okay. So mute yourself, Rob. Go ahead. Hi, uh, interesting presentation. Um, so I have a question on the chart that showed the various uh, sciences or pseudosciences and things in uh, psychology where they fell on the axes. Yeah. And homeopathy, um, I was kind of surprised to see it was where it was. Um, and it later was claimed as, as, I think it was claimed specifically as bullshit. Yeah. So do you not believe any of the proponents, including the doctors in that field, actually believe it works? Right. I, I, there's very clear evidence that it doesn't work. The only thing that works in the case of homeopathy is a placebo effect. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's not my question. Your, your definition of bullshit is whether the person believes what they're saying or not. No, no, no. So, um, yeah, that's a good, thank you for pointing that out. The original definition of bullshit by Harry Frank Frankfurt included, you know, whether they whether the bullshitter cares or doesn't care. The version that I'm presenting that I presented for most of the talk, which comes out of the second author that I mentioned, is more specific. It's more it's more uh, accurate, and it says that the the bullshitter it's not that he doesn't care necessarily, but he fails to up to, to follow. Uh, sound epistemic practices. So yes, the homeopaths certainly care, and so do care the astrologers, so so the ufologists, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But they are engage they're engaging in gross failures of ep epistemic malpractice. That's the claim, right? And the reason for that, of course, you know, but that one could say, well, why are these people, some of whom are you know literate and intelligent and so on and so forth, why are they? Uh, failing epistemically in such an abysmal way. And there, the reason that is being proposed is that the reason they do that is because there is a um, there are psychological or and or ideological uh, sort of uh, motives that, that overcome the sound epistemic practice. And as I said, skeptics are not immune from those kind of ideological motives. Okay. Uh... Rob, I'm sorry, that was you. I did I not lower your hand? That's it, right? Rob. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry about that. So Michael Beck. Oh, unmute. Okay. Thank you for unmuting me. Until I figure out the interface. My um I have um a, two okay, at least one question, but I've seen to have lost the second one. Where on this axis or in this class of pseudoscience or pseudophilosophy would you class things like um, somebody shot Kennedy who wasn't Lee Harvey Oswald? <laughs> would that be a pseudo current events science in the sense it's not history? Uh, I'm not sure. Does yeah. it, is there any relation? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, Moberger does talk about uh, conspiracy theories and uh, and pseudo history, but te 
typically history is not considered a science, although there's debate there as well. And so that's why you didn't see it on, on that diagram, because I was focused mostly on the science, pseudoscience, the uh, demarcation. But just like there is a science pseudoscience and there is a philosophy pseudophilosophy, there can easily be a history pseudohistory. Like all on, uh, if you want a clear case, Holocaust denial is a case of pseudohistory. Right. Yeah, the point in body count. Yeah, yeah. My other question is, what about scientists who, in other words, make pseudoscientific claims? The specific case I'm thinking of is Sir Lang, a famed algebraist of unquestioned accomplishments of both teaching and writing, who also claimed publicly in the HIV denialism, it's nearly not the virus. Or Arthur C. Clarke, who had a PhD in engineering, worked for NASA, and later on fully embraced anti-gravity and free energy and over unity energy sources. How do you, what would you class on that? Well, human beings are, are what they are. Like for instance, in the case of somebody who is a famous, alge famous algebraist, what is this business going to talk about, uh, you know, viruses? He's not an expert on viruses. And so he should just shut up. That's the that's the problem. That especially when scientists become very famous or you know they're very smart and very well recognized. Sometimes this is referred to as the Nobel effect, uh, as in you win the Nobel, for instance, in particle physics, and all of a sudden you're telling the rest of the world how to solve uh, you know economic problems or social problems. Like what is your business doing that? That's not why. That's not your area of expertise. And so in those cases, I think are cases of hubris. These are cases, those are, those are cases where somebody who simply does not have the competence in that particular field starts talking because he thinks of, uh, very highly of himself and he thinks that anything that he says uh, is, is, is interesting or ought to be interesting to other people. We all suffer to some extent from that kind of hubris, but some people, again, it becomes pathological. Uh, Olga, C can you unmute yourself or I have to? I think I have to okay. ask. Okay. Hi, I would like um, to ask a question about recent events. And please uh, he, uh, listen to this question to the end because it, it's uh, from the beginning, it doesn't sound what I would like to ask. Um, uh, just um, recently, we had on news leaked video of UFO. And then government confirmed that it's real video. And actually, uh, something like uh, a year ago, there was also leaked video and they confirmed. And a year ago, I, I kind of discussed it, probably even on skeptics, and it seems like a year ago, everybody were uh, like uh, all uh, uh, all news were about COVID and everybody were engaged in this and people did not so much uh, react on it. And now it's not so much reaction. If this video would be uh, leaked like 10, 15, five years ago, everybody would be all over it. So what's really going in from your point of view? Why it's leaked right now? What it's some kind of psychological experiment or try to divert people's attention from something, or why it's confirmed, why people don't really react to it so much, because ufologist, and you mentioned a couple of times why I'm, I'm asking this question, uh, them, so why they don't react so much on, the, on what is going on right now? It's real videos, uh, government confirmation, and not so much around it. Why? It's a good question. And the simple answer is, I don't know. Uh, it, you know, if, it, it, this, is a question, this, this is a question for a sociologist. Uh, you know, why is it that news that I agree with you, those, those are those, in different times, that would have been fairly big news, at least for the uh, among ufologists and skeptics. Uh, very few people seem to be paying attention. They're just rolling with it. Is it because uh, a lot of people have lost uh, confidence in the government and therefore even when they come up with this kind of stuff, they say, oh, that's probably going to be some kind of bullshit. Uh, 
uh, that's possible. It's also because you know I took a quick look at the at the videos in question. They're not very impressive. I mean, it's not like they're showing you know an alien ship with somebody coming out of it. It's, it's like these that, these lights and the, these these things that are not clear in the sky. And we've seen plenty of those things before, including from governmental sources. I mean, this is not. This is not the first time that the, the U.S. government or other governments release, uh, you know, that kind of footage. In fact, the Campeche UFOs that I was mentioning during my talk, they, that video was released and authenticated by the uh, Mexican military. And, that in, and that's why people started paying attention to it. But it turns out still that it was certainly not aliens visiting, uh, visiting Earth. I mean, we often tend to forget that the word UFO is not the same as the word flying saucer, right? A UFO literally just means unidentified flying objects. There's all sorts of stuff that could be unidentified, not because it's strange, not because it's come, come from outside of this world, but simply because we don't have enough information uh, at, the, at that particular moment to analyze it. But it's a good question, and I, I would love to hear the opinion of some sociologists uh, or psychologists about why there has been comparatively less attention to these cases uh, recently. Yeah. Thanks. Hey. Uh, Nirav and then Daniel. All right, thanks. Um, so you mentioned examples of skeptics who've uh, gotten into pseudo philosophy, and you, you mentioned names, but I, I was hoping for, I guess, some specific examples of 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 things that they actually said. And then the que my question is also, like, what can they do better to prevent that? Because I assume that it's not their intent to um, to, to be doing that as skeptics, but at the same time, that, that's kind of the definition of, B, of the BS and the pseudo philosophy right. that, that they aren't appropriately engaging. Right. Well, I did give, I mean, it's a good question, but I did give you one specific example, and that was the, the penis oaks. Uh, that I mentioned near the, well, near, near is the end. Is that the an issue with about pseudoscience or pseudo? No, that's pseudo philosophy because the target where uh, scholars in in some certain areas of philosophy, continental philosophy, um, but you know, uh, like Sam Harris, for instance, starts out the, his famous book, the, the Moral Landscape, by saying that he's going to ignore everything that comes out of philosophy because he finds it boring. Literally, he says so, um, and and then he moves on to do actually quite a bit of, you know, take on quite a bit of philosophical baggage in, uh, uh, on board. Uh, or even, you know, luminaries like Stephen Hawking, uh, one of his last books started out with the uh, phrase, you know, philosophy is dead and we're not going to, you know, we're not going to do that anymore. And then he, the rest of the book is, in fact, a book on the philosophy of cosmology. Uh, so th there's lots of examples. Richard Dawkins is a repeated offender. I mean, I, I could probably dig out a large number of references. Um, now, the question is, what should they do? I would say it's very simple. Shut up. Uh, just don't say it because it's not your field. Why? Why is it? Why is it that these people are compelled to talk about things in which they literally don't know anything about? Uh, I remember an, a very stark episode a few years ago during, in fact, one of my book lunches here in New York. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson showed up. I, I invited him to come, and he very graciously came. Uh, and then went in the back uh, of the room and started sitting down with some of the graduate students uh, in philosophy from the graduate center. And they started talking, you know, they started talking about stuff. And, and then I talked to the, uh, to the graduate students. I said, so what was, uh, what happened there? What was, what was going on? And they were aghast because these were all people who were actually, you know, in awe of Neil deGrasse Tyson just sitting there uh, among them. And the guy just said one incorrect thing after another about philosophy. And at some point later on, I, asked him, I said, Neil, did you ever read a technical philosophy paper or book? And his answer was no. And so I said, then what the hell are you talking about? I mean, imagine if I all of a sudden started doing, you know, criticism of cosmology or quantum mechanics, and then somebody says, well, but have you actually ever read something about quantum mechanics? Do you understand quantum mechanics? I said, no. Well, what kind of credibility do I have? Right. So I think my, my suggestion would be that for these people should simply not engage in this kind of talk. Just stick to what you know, man. If it's the uh, Dastaisen, stick to uh, you know, astronomy. If it is dark and stick to biology and so on and so forth. Or if you do want, because it, it is important, in fact, that scientists and philosophy engage in crosstalk, but they need to do it knowing each other's. Uh, areas of expertise and respecting each other's areas of expertise. And as I said, there are culprits on both sides of the of the aisle here. It's not just the scientists. That I know a number of philosophers who also bullshit about science. How, how did Neil deGrasse Tyson respond when you when you pointed he out that he, he shrugged? He said, okay. <laughs> like, okay, so okay. that's the BS is like not caring about doing correct. It. Yeah, correct, okay. exactly. Yeah. 
Okay, uh, Daniel. Thank you. Um, I missed the beginning. I am extremely interested in the topic. So I hope at least the slides, if not the lecture will be made available uh, to me. Um, but I, I did, uh, but I was able to see some of it, which was terrific, Massimo. Thank you. On the subject of uh, uh, bush, um, bullshitting being related to virtue epistemology, um, I recall previously um, you distinguished uh, virtue from, excuse, yeah, virtue ethics from other forms of ethics as um, the, the, the focus of virtue ethics is sort of personal. Right. My question is, um, when the bullshitters, um, uh, when the bullshitters are using some sort of institution um, uh, to, to disseminate their information, um, does a kind of virtue ethics or does a kind of virtue epistemology map uh, apply to that institution? That institution could be Twitter, Liberty University, JP Morgan, whatever is their um, platform. Yeah. yeah. You see, yeah. you see where I'm going? Yes, yes, absolutely. And that, that's a great question. Uh, I would say that in some cases, clearly, yes. In other cases, more complicated. For instance, uh, let's uh, contrast Twitter on the one hand as a platform and the Institute for Creation Science on the other hand. Right. So in the case of the Institute for Creation Science, yes, the entire institution is devoted to the propagation of bullshit as, as far as I'm concerned. Right. And why is that? Well, because all of them are bullshitters in the sense, in the specific sense that I uh, defined here. They're, that is, they're really epistemically at fault here. These are not stupid people. Right, because one of the things about this, the the uh, uh, the bullshitter is that these are not people who are incapable of uh, you know arriving at the right conclusions given the evidence. They just don't because they don't care enough about following the evidence where it goes. Why not? Because they are they are uh, you know the, 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 there is the, the the issue of ideology in this particular case, religious ideology that gets in in the way. Now, in the case of Twitter, on the other hand, no, I don't think that just because some people or a lot of people bullshit on Twitter, you can necessarily tag Twitter itself as a bullshitting platform because for any bullshitter on Twitter, there are other people who actually are trying to do their best epistemically speaking. They are honest agents and so on and so forth. May I, may I ask a follow-up? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I think I can make a bridge between what you just said now and something I, I had heard you previously say in a meeting, um, uh, which absolutely dropped my jaw. You had said um, that the the distinction, you were making a distinction between a politician who has a personal moral compass, which we might consider invalid, but a, a policy <clears throat> initiative, um, which, which we would say that's good. So they may be personally <clears throat> motivated by, let's say, uh, deontology, <clears throat> but their, their approach to policy is, is um, creating a, a, a virtuous society or something. Mm -hmm. You made this kind of distinction. I, I absolutely loved it. I don't think I'd heard it uh, before. So now I'm trying to bridge that idea of a, a distinction from the, the agent and now the institution, yeah. Congress or something, um, to virtue epistemology. And, uh, you know, so we have a forum which is, which, which is consistently guilty, mm -hmm. but, but we're going to make a distinction between saying, but therefore the forum or the research program um, uh, is still salvageable. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm wondering if you can speak to that. Well, if I understand you correctly, the issue here is uh, in terms of virtue ethics in general, which virtue epistemology is a subset, of course, of virtu virtue ethics, right? So, so virtue ethics would say, look, uh, institutions or societies or you know groups uh, and so on etc etc cetera, et cetera, are simply the result of whatever percolates up from the individuals that compose those institutions that make up those institutions right so twitter is to some extent the 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 uh, total the sum, total sum of the users and of course the people that make the rules not just the users because the people who make the rules are are uh, are part of, of the equation or Congress. Well, what is Congress? Congress doesn't exist independently of the people who are actually elected there. And of course, again, of the rules that regulate uh, those elections and those behaviors, et cetera, et cetera. Rules that of course can be changed. Changed by who? Well, by 
actors. So in, in virtual ethics, the, net, the general notion is that everything percolates up, right? Whether it is uh, virtue in the sense of moral virtue or whether it is epistemic virtue or whether it is any, any other kind of virtue. It's a, it's a system that looks at, it's an approach that looks at things from the bottom up, which is, by the way, why I uh, made a couple of reference, not so subtle references to the fact that we should start by cleaning our own house, right? Uh, that is because we want, if we want a, a world where people are not bullshitters, but they are epistemically con uh, conscientious, then we should start by being epistemically conscientious, right? And if you want a, a, a world where people are, uh, you know, ethical and, and act morally, then you should start by acting ethically and morally. Otherwise, you know, who the hell are you? Otherwise, you're an hypocrite, right? Otherwise, you're, who the hell are you to talking to start criticizing other people if your own house is not, uh, is not uh, cleaned up a little, at least a little bit? And as I said, by the way, Right. this doesn't mean uh, this is an important point it doesn't mean that we ought to reach per epistemic perfection before we can start criticizing other people that is another kind of bullshit in a sense because epistemic perfection is simply not possible for human beings human beings are fallible uh, we are we are affected by cognitive biases we're affected by you know uh, our abilities of reasoning uh, is is limited uh, the data that we have available of course is also limited and has uh, you know, they can, can easily lead us in certain circumstances to the wrong conclusion. But if that is done by in good faith and by applying the highest possible epistemic standards, then that's all you can reasonably ask for of somebody, right? Thank you very much. That is the strongest argument for virtue ethics I've ever heard. Thank you. I, <laughs> thank you very much for that. That was... And Yes. Thank you. And by the way, the, the talk will be uh, available. It's been recorded. And so I'll, I'll do some editing and we'll, we'll post it out on YouTube. Thank you. Yeah. yeah so I, I want to ask a question. Um, I, I want to see if I can, if I can understand well the, the distinction between the Frankfurt version of bullshit, uh, what we can call it classic bullshit, is it? Yes. And, and the version that you would use to refer to uh, people like Neil deGrasse Tyson and Dawkins as being bullshitters. Uh, in, in the Frankfurt version, uh, the, the people who bullshit have an agenda and, and they just don't care what the truth is, right? right. So that makes them bullshit. In the case of, of Dawkins, and they just don't care enough. Right. And that's what makes them bullshit, right? So. Uh, well, so first of all, uh, yes. When we say does, don't care, they don't care, the question is they don't care about what? Presumably, as has been pointed out earlier, even people who support you know, uh, pseudoscientific notions, they do care about it. They want to be right. right? Uh, what they don't care about, apparently, is, is maintaining high standards of, of epistemic warrant, as philosophers would, would say. Right? So they're sloppy, basically. Um, and why are they sloppy? Not because they're stupid, not because they're ignorant, not because they are not capable of doing better, but because their fundamental drive is actually either psychological or ideological. Right? So the, ideally, what we want skeptics and scientists and philosophers to be driven uh, by is a quest for truth. Right? Of course, we understand that because we're all human beings, everybody has biases, everybody has ideological you know, backgrounds and so on and so forth. But what makes you a good philosopher, a good scientist, or a good uh, uh, skeptic, I think, is the notion that you're aware of these biases and you actively fight against these biases and you, you try to do something at a communal level with other skeptics, other scientists, or other philosophers that actually has, you know, the highest uh, epistemic warrants. The distinction between that kind of approach and the pseudo philosophy or pseudo science is that these pe these other people seem to be driven more, more clearly, more fundamentally by their either ideological or psychological biases, and they just don't care enough about the reality of things. So long as something fits, uh, so long as a notion fits uh, their preconception, they'll go for it. And when it doesn't fit their preconception, they're going to reject it no matter what. I mean, if you just if if you heard anybody. Uh, defending creationists, for instance, it's very clear that's what they're doing. It's, the, the, creationism is probably the most clear example I can think of, of somebody who is obviously motivated by an ideological position, in that case, fundamentalist uh, Christianity. And they are obviously rejecting 
uh, facts, notions, arguments, et cetera, et cetera. They're very sound and they're coming up with arguments and, and notions that are not sound at all. And it's equally clear that these people are not ignorant. Some, some creationists have a PhD. It's clear that they're not stupid. Uh, but it is also very clear that, unfortunately, sadly, they are overwhelmed by their uh, ideological biases. And one of the things that I, I'm, I keep trying to, to warn ourselves about is that we should be careful not to fall into the same trap, because otherwise, instead of skeptics, we're going to be just as bad bullshitters as the others. Right. Good. Uh, Ryan? Hello? Hello? Hi, can you hear me? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, great to meet you, and I enjoy what's going on with this talk. I was just wanting to ask, um, when it comes to, you know, uh, when it comes to the idea of bullshit, um, what is it that equates or correlates between those with high IQs that seem to, especially within great status like Neil deGrasse and all those other figures, what seems to correlate between their high IQs and their um, consistent need to bullshit within their own ideology, uh, ide sorry, their, their, their own. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, it's a great question. It's a great question. And ironically, I think, uh, Michael Shermer wrote a whole book about this uh, several years ago. Um, he's, he's one of the offenders in my mind, at least. But he wrote a book about this kind of stuff, he, uh, explaining you know why people believe weird things. And one of the things about the in that book, I think one of the last chapters was about why some particularly smart people believe weird things. It's like how is it possible? You know, it's the, the standard stereotype is well, I understand why the country bumpkin, uh, you know, will believe all sorts of bullshit. But why is it that a scientist or why is it that you know somebody with a PhD in economics or whatever it is believe that sort of stuff? And in fact. Michael's uh, suggestion there, I think, was interesting. It was empirically based. There's, there's some research about this. And that the notion is that when people become really smart, if that intelligence is coupled with a strong ideological bias of some sort, then smart people are particularly good at bullshitting because they're smart. So they, they know all the, you know, all the roundabout ways to defend their, their position. They know how to poke holes into the other person's position precisely because they're smart. So there's nothing as dangerous as a smart bullshitter. Uh, you know, the, the non-smart bullshit, you can figure it out a mile away and it's not, it's not a problem. It's the smart bullshitter that is problematic. Now, in the case of people also like, you know, Neil, for instance, uh, or Dawkins, I think there, re there really is uh, a, a significant amount of what the Greeks called hubris going on there, uh, which is also associated particularly with smart people. Um, if you're really smart and if you're told they're real, really smart all the time, then you start thinking that you can pontificate about pretty much anything because, you know, you're smart. And uh, that's a fallacy. Uh, but, uh, you know, it makes you feel very good uh, about, your, about yourself. And so uh, I think it is really a kind of, of hubris. And again, to some extent, I don't want to say that... Uh, you know, those are the people that suffer from it and the rest of us are saints. There's no such a thing as saints. We all have egos. We all have, presumably, we're all subject, presumably, to a little bit of hubris. We're all subject to a little bit of bullshitting. But that's why in the in the talk i said you know the problem is not when everybody does it because that's a normal kind of range range, range of human, no, normal human behavior the problem is when it becomes pathological right when it becomes a, a standard modus operandi uh and that that becomes problematic in in in, in the case of of scientists that have an issue with philosophy do you think is contempt for philosophy in general that is a yeah, that's a good question. Um, to some extent, yes, and that's you know it's a it's a national sport or international sport even to have contempt for philosophy these days. So I think that's uh, that to some extent that is true. Uh, there is also a couple of other things going on, however. Uh, people like um, uh, Lawrence Krauss and the Grass Tyson, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, they actually re still responding to the science wars of the 1990s. They got shocked by the fact that all of a sudden a bunch of philosophers started criticizing science. And starting, you know, trying to put science in its place. And uh, even though the, the wars of the 90s have been over for now, you know, a decade and a half at least, uh, they are still fighting the same the same war. 
And, you know, it's never, and, and, and to be fair, philosophy is in the business, even good philosophy, not, I'm not talking about the extreme postmodernism, but let's say good philosophy of science, it is in the business of making prescriptive statements about their, their uh, area of interest. So a philosopher of science often will say critical things about science and scientists, and nobody likes to be criticized, all right? So it's, it's, a, human, it's a human reaction. Yeah. Okay, Arvind? Unmute, please. There you go. Oh, Arvind. Hello. You're can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, sorry. Uh, really, uh, thanks, Benny. Uh, really great presentation, sir. I really enjoyed your presentation. I, you. I wanted to thank you first of all. Uh, and it's really important that. Uh, we, we uh, uh, have access to your book so we can keep revising all revisiting and revising all these things because it's too much to take in in one setting sometimes and uh, these are valuable tools for our daily life especially uh, the critical uh, learning or the thinking techniques that you teach my question is uh, this is becoming more and more important to each of us in society uh, i wanted to take uh, take your opinion on how much of this can we imp incorporate into our formal learning systems in schools, universities, how much of philosophy should scientists learn? How much of philosophy should doctors learn? You know, at least in terms of ethics and, you know, virtue ethics, like Daniel was talking about all these things. Uh, do you think making it mandatory will help or will it harm, you know? I mean, the minute you take a test on something, people tend to, you know, take an aversion to it or they might try to cheat on it or just try to learn whatever is necessary to pass the exam. But how could you uh, uh, build, or is it even possible? That is a meta question here. Uh, is it even possible to create a, a structured learning, a teaching mechanism uh, for people to imbibe this in each and every person? Or what do you think around that? Thanks. Yeah, that's a great question. Yes, I do think it's possible. In fact, it has been done uh, on and off in other, in other countries. Uh, you know, I, I do think that philosophy and ethics, you know, philosophy as in logic and critical thinking and ethics ought to be taught uh, even ma in a mandatory fashion, <laughs> even before college level. I think they should be at least introduced at least at the high school level. And if not, it's not even at the middle school level, as it is in other countries. They're, they're, these things are studied in other countries. So yes, it's certainly possible. Is there going to be a backlash or reaction? Sure, you know, everybody, nobody likes to be mandated to do anything. But at the same time, we have no trouble mandating people to, you know, take science courses before they graduate from college. We have no no problem mandating people from taking, you know, literature courses uh, before graduating from college. So I don't see why why not philosophy. And this is done, of course, on an institution by institution basis uh, in some universities, even in the United States. Like for instance, years ago, I remember. Uh, visiting uh, Notre Dame University, which is a Catholic institution. And uh, they boast the largest philosophy department in, they say, in the world. I actually think it's in the United States because there are larger philosophy departments in other areas. But nevertheless, and I was having this com you know, pleasant conversation dinner over dinner with the chair of the department. I said, so how do you guys do it? You know, how did you get these many faculty positions and all that sort of stuff? And he looked at me, smiled, and he said, uh, well, this is a Catholic university. We mandate that everybody has to take at least two philosophy courses, otherwise they don't graduate. And that builds in automatic uh, you know, request for philosophy courses and therefore for faculty positions, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this may sound outrageous. If you talk to, to the scientists, of, at least of a certain persuasion, uh, they might tell you that that's an outrageous waste of time. But it is exactly what we mandate in other fields. You know, nobody should get should graduate from college with a minimum, without a minimum of science understanding or a minimum of mathematics understanding. Uh, or a minimum understanding of history, or a minimum understanding of you know knowledge of literature. Nobody should have that. Should not be a college degree uh, if you, if you do that. And I don't see why philosophy shouldn't be part of that of that group. It used to be, of course. This is a fairly recent development uh, in the in the United States. Uh, Arvin, do you want to do? I'm sorry. Can, can I uh, Arvin next? But I, I wanted to follow up with a short question on this. This goes to a pet peeve of mine that certain words have certain uh, preconceived notions that are boring. So philosophy has this thing, oh, who wants to learn philosophy? Do you think it might be better if we, uh, as, as a general thing, came up with a term of something that you should teach, I think, cri inside critical thinking, instead of just forcing people to take philosophy courses? Well... It's a general, and, and 
you and I have had this discussion. Yes, regarding- we have. Okay. We have. And, and you, know, you know my position. I don't, I don't think it's a matter of words. I mean, you're right that there are certain words that, that automatically trigger certain responses. Like, as you know, because we've had this discussion before, skepticism is one such word, right? Um, however, there are two alternatives there. Either you rebrand and you call it something else, or you educate people. My preference tends to be for educating people, not rebranding, uh, for two reasons. First of all, because there is a history behind these terms. There is a, you know, there's a whole literature. If you all of a sudden start using a different term, then people that are going to look for uh, you know, previous uh, literature in that area are not going to find it because they're going to use the word the, the, the wrong word. And also because people catch up. They're not stupid. People catch up with the new word. Right. Uh, so it used to be that atheist uh, was the, the word and then atheist became bad word. And so now we are secular humanists. And of course, now secular humanism is a bad word. Uh, it doesn't take much for people to, to, to catch up with that. So I rather educate people than, than uh, sort of keep playing these, these, these word game. But you're right. There certainly is that sort of notion or, you know, philosophy has, has become, uh, you know, associated with, you know, the, the quintessential boring and, and useless field. But we have other fields that are just as boring or perceived as just as boring. You know, like who, who really, other than a few people, uh, enjoys going into a math class or into a chemistry class or something? Like that? And yet they do it. Why do they have to do it? Because it's mandatory. You're not going to graduate from college unless you actually do it. And, and who knows, you know, you actually might learn a, a thing or two uh, by uh, being mandated to do it. Yeah. Uh, Arpin? Um, sorry, I have a follow-up question, sir. Sure. Um, with regard to uh, ethics in highly technical fields like um, medical research or, or uh, you know, um, artificial intelligence, uh, you know, uh, human cloning. These are uh, con- controversial topics by themselves. Yes. And currently, there are ethics guidelines. Uh, you know that uh, scientists should not clone humans, or that uh, humans. I mean, uh, the Google engineer should not program an AI that can uh, be sentient without a, pro- a formal approval process or whatever. So right. my question is: Do you think these ethics guidelines alone are enough for a scientist to understand and obey, or do you think we should uh, force them to learn philosophy so hmm. that they imbibe the the you know the totality of the ethics guidelines, which are just guidelines, but they should understand the uh, rationale and the reasoning behind these guidelines uh, because these are too important and sensitive let's take uh, you know bioterrorism or you know something like that uh, you mm-hmm. know people uh, researchers working in um, uh, dangerous uh, drug deliveries or uh, research on covid something like that so I, I, do you think that these guidelines alone are sufficient or would you rather have them learn philosophy in a formal structure do you think uh, that, mm-hmm. that that is a better way yeah, that's a good question. No, I think that guidelines by themselves are never sufficient, although they're a good start po- starting point, because if you put in place guidelines, then it means that somebody cares, right? Whoever put together the guidelines uh, actually get, cares. And that's certainly a good beginning. I think that, uh, you know, mandating scientists, you know, professional scientists to, to learn ethics, I think that's impractical. Although, as I said, uh, people should study ethics uh, earlier on in college and, and, and in high school. Um, what I think would be ideal is is to have, and, and I think this is the direction where, where things are going, actually, is a continuing dialogue between the interested parties, right? And interesting parties include uh, the ethicists who know the ethics, but not necessarily the science that well, and the scientists who know the science, but not necessarily the ethics that well. That's, that's why that's a typical interdisciplinary problem. And when you have interdisciplinary problems, you can have two approaches to it. Either you have the same person learn everything, and become an expert on the whole thing. That's not very practical. Or you can have a bunch of different people from different perspectives coming into the problem and each, each one you know, providing their, uh, uh, their background and their knowledge their, their, to, to the discussion, to the table in the discussion table. So I mean, that's the way to do it. And that is the way in which it seems like things are going. Like for instance, at the National Science Foundation or the National Institute of Health, of Health that's the way it seems to be working, that ethicists and you know, philosophers have been invited, even philosophers of science have been invited more and more to, on, to be on panel discussions, on grant proposals, uh, discussions, and so on and so forth, not to, to uh, of course, adjudicate the science, but to inform the people that are making decisions about the science uh, on uh, uh, related issues such as uh, the ethics or the epistemic warrant, if, it, if, it, uh, if we're talking about philosophers of science. Uh, Rob? We have only a few more minutes, uh, so Benny, you you pick. But we got another f- six minutes. 
Well, Rob, Rob, have you gone already? I don't remember. I think you have. So can we give a chance to uh, Theodoros and then we'll go back to you? So. We, we might have time, but yeah. Okay, yeah. I just wanted to give a chance yeah. to those who haven't mm -hmm. had a chance yet. Uh, thanks. Uh, I guess going back to the figure you gave of, uh, about the, where the science is falling, this empirical content, theoretical and uh, sophistication, is bullshit like an orthogonal dimension to this? Do the other things matter when we classify something as pseudoscience? Or like, is bullshit the only thing that matters that to say that something is pseudoscience? Or is, you know, the fact that it's not progressive or that, it's, that, it, or that it always requires new assumptions and, you know. Right. Well, so uh, the bullshitting part of the equation here has to do with epistemic practice, right? And so you don't want anybody to do epistemic malpractice, regardless of whether they're pushing pseudo, what we think of of a pseudoscience or what we think of as science. I mean, there is such a thing as epistemic malpractice within science. Uh, one of the things that the, the article that I mentioned discusses, for instance, is scientific fraud, right? Scientific fraud is a clear case of you know, malpractice, but there is the motivation is a different one. Uh, and, and yet the, the individuals that, that are guilty of that kind of malpractice are still doing epistemic malpractice in a sense, right? They're not taking their data seriously or they're not, they, they're not producing quality data and so on and so forth. But you don't want to call that pseudoscience because it's a, it's a different uh, dynamic at play, right? These are, uh, within the sciences, you can actually typically uh, spot the, the person who has done you know, the fraud or, the, or the, the work that is fraudulent or the work that is out, uh, that is wrong, even simply forget fraud. Scientists make mistakes, right? And that's why there is a peer review process both before uh, publication and after publication. I mean, people tend to think that the peer review process is only before publication, but basically once a paper has been published, it's un it undergoes a constant peer review process because people are going to read it. And if somebody's going to find something wrong with it, don't worry, they're, they're going to they're gonna write about it or they're going to do something something about it, right? So I think that the issue of epistemic practice is, is where the the core here of the debate of the discussion is in terms of uh, bullshitting. But of course, there's all sorts of other characteristics that we want of a good scientific theory or a good scientific program. For instance, you mentioned the, the word progressive. Uh, Imre Lakatos, who was one of the uh, most influential philosophers of science of the middle part of the 20th, 20th century, said that you know good research programs, scientific research programs are progressive, meaning that they constantly put out uh, you know, uh, uh, new ideas that generate new discoveries and then those feed feedback into new ideas, et cetera, et cetera. At some point, if a research program becomes degenerative, it doesn't produce any, no any, any novelty, any new findings about the world, that doesn't mean it's pseudoscience. It just means that it's exhausted uh, its, its, its path. You know, there's not much else that you can do in that. And there are plenty of areas of science historically where we got to that point. I mean, if you, know, you want to do research today in certain areas of physics, uh, biology or chemistry, your advisor, your PhD advisor is going to discourage you from doing it because like, well, there is nothing there to do. It's like th those areas are basically closed. They've been dead for a number of uh, decades and there is not much there going, going on. That doesn't make them into pseudoscience. It just makes them into research programs that, that don't need to be funded because they're not uh, seemingly going anywhere. Okay, one more, Vishal. Uh, you can un yeah, uh, hi. Uh, hi. I just have a question to, uh, related to something which came up in the chat. Uh, I think you may have glossed over it. Uh, what, what's your position on Jordan Peterson? What do you <laughs> think about his uh, integrity? And uh, <laughs> uh, like, is he is it pseudoscience at times? Is it other times science or what do no. you think? No, I would think he's, he, he very rarely talks about science. Uh, no, he's, he's a, on the other hand, a, a pseudo philosophy bullshitter of the first order. Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, he really does, he, he really is a good example of somebody who doesn't seem to be caring that much about the epistemic warrant of what he says. Uh, he's very obfusc, he uses, he, he does, he has all the, the characteristics that um, I mentioned during the talk, he uses obs obfuscatory language, uh, you know, in, 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 in indulges into uh, equivocal statements so that he can always, that he says something that it seems like it's uh, you know, very interesting and potentially controversial. And then when you call in on it and you say, well, no, I'm, I didn't mean that, I meant this, but but this turns out to be something more, much more trivial. So yeah, I would consider Peterson a, a ma major example of pseudo-philosophical bullshitter. And I'm surprised that people like Michael Shermer giving a platform 
Uh, and that's, that's really unconscionable, I think. And on that note, <laughs> Benny, I think that's, uh, that's about it for today. Good timing. Yeah. Um, thanks, guys, for, for coming. This, this was a lot of fun for me. Uh, I hope it was informative for you. And uh, as I said, we'll, Benny and I will edit the video and, and post it. And thank you very much, Masimov. Thank you for coming. Well, I'm sure we'll have you soon for another thing.